So welcome everyone to this panel discussion on biology bridges. I'm Dewar Kusharkar and currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University and Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, we'll discuss how we how uh, research may go from biomolecules to biomodeling to biomimetics. And for that, we have three uh, former JB scholars with us as panelists today. And I'll briefly introduce them. So uh, the, the first panelist or the panelist representing the first aspect of this, uh, uh, of this, of this topic is Professor Onirvan Ganguly. He is a JB scholar from the 2003 batch and is currently an assistant professor of biochemistry at Ames Deoghar. Uh, his research interests are in, cl in clinical biochemistry and molecular neuroscience. He received his undergraduate degree in medicine and surgery from RG Corps Medical College and Hospital and his master's in biochemistry from IPGMER and SSKM Hospital. And prior to his current position, he was affiliated with the biochemistry department of NRS Medical College and Hospital. So welcome, Professor Ganguly. Welcome. And Thanks, Barbara, for inviting me for this talk. Pleasant sure. surprise to meet <laughs> with my seniors. <laughs> and of course, you are a junior JB scholar. And currently, we are not having such meeting for a long time. Right. And this is a very great platform to enter. Thank you. So uh, our next panelist, again, in the order of our discussion is Professor Shitabro uh, Sina. He is a JB scholar from 1989 batch. He's currently a professor of theoretical physics and computational biology at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, India. He received his bachelor's in physics from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, his master's in pure physics from the University College of Science uh, at the University of Calcutta, and his PhD from the Indian Statistical Institute, where he was affiliated with the Machine Intelligence Unit. Former to the current position, he was a postdoc at the physics department of the Indian Institute of Science and the Whale Medical College of Cornell University, USA. His research interests are in complex systems, nonlinear dynamics, computational biophysics, systems neuroscience, econophysics, and many, many other things. I think. So welcome, Professor Sinha. Thanks, Devargo. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. The, Next speaker is Professor Orindam Basu. He's a JB scholar from 2000 batch. He's an uh, associate professor of electrical and electronic engineering at Nanyang Un Technological University at Singapore. He received his BTEC in electronics and electrical communication engineering from IIT Kharagpur, his master's in mathematics from Georgia Institute of Technology and his PhD in electrical and computer engineering also from Georgia Tech. He researches on novel brain-inspired electronics. So, yeah, uh, welcome, Professor Basu. Uh, thanks a lot, thanks a lot, Debargo. Again, um, it was it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, all right. So, uh, you know, we can probably start uh, the discussion. You know, hearing from you in a few words how. If, uh, whatever you want to start with, essentially along the lines of the research in your group, how your field contributes to this uh, research, you know, going from a molecular experimental research modeling and uh, and and you know, using that in uh, different avenues than mainstream biology, maybe in engineering or other areas, and also why or how did you find yourself working in this area? So, shall we start with Professor Ganguly first? Yeah, uh, should I uh, start with the slides or just a general discussion first? Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe in words, a few words first. And, uh, we yeah, can actually, uh, see, whenever, uh, after I did my MBBS and since I had a JB background, I visited four talent enrichment programs. Usually one was necessary. So that was very uh, inspiring for me at that young level to visit three or four cities and visit all the top institutions. I think I visited Institute of Mathematical Science in my first visit and uh, like that. So research was always always a, a priority uh, or maybe uh, my desire, even when you know I was doing the rounds in the medical colleges, very grueling duty, 36 hours, 48 hours and 
the patient care load was so high that there was hardly any time for research mm. but uh, then after mbbs basically i uh, for preparation for md i found a very suitable job at uh, nicd that is national institute of cholera and enteric disease uh, virology in, which is in the belaghat id campus and it is a very uh, good research lab for you know medical professionals uh, very good quality labs are there at nice so there i was started working as senior research fellow medical and i was working in the swine flu project that was a very big thing at that time and uh, then of course i got my md and hs came and i joined in biochemistry department and as it happens uh, your research team often sometimes get influenced by the type of work you do at the thesis level so my guide professor shashank chakravarti was head of biochemistry he was a former pass out from phu uh, and uh, he was very much uh, research oriented uh, in his approach so since i was his uh, md student so he has a, he had a very good lab having a mix of md and phd students and uh, we had a very uh, good lab compared to the other medical colleges of kolkata so the only reason being he had a number of research projects of dst dbt icmr uh, which is very, usually very rare for uh, medical faculties in our state so as a result uh, even though we are uh, doing clinical biochemistry rounds and central lab so we were posted in different uh, you know research labs as well because i was his direct student and his uh, theme of uh, research was again neuroscience mainly alzheimer's disease parkinson's disease aging brain and naturally uh, my work centered around those parts so i became an integral part of the cell culture lab that he had at uh, sskm hospital so like that uh, my interest started growing there and that is why i always wanted to work in a central institute uh, after doing my master so i went to aims raipur and then again came to nrs but there are some limitations in state colleges as far as research is concerned uh, quite difficult sometimes so again i have jumped short and joined aims deogar so basically it's a new aim so since it has a name tag so gradually within a span of 2 to 5 years i think uh, we will get some very decent quality lab and since we are founding faculty we are actually shaping how to build our department and how to focus on research and all that so now i think i can move to the slides where i just very briefly narrated the nature of work or what we have done in my lab this work is mainly based on the work i have done at uh, hsk okay so will you share the slide or i should share the slide debargo yeah i Hello. guess you, you can you can go ahead uh we can if if there is an issue then i can try sharing from my side but you can definitely okay okay can you see the slide yes yeah is it visible yes yes yeah it's visible it's okay. visible yeah so the topic uh, we have today is uh, we have uh, already mentioned biology bridges by molecules to by modeling to biomimetics so the research interest Uh, which are present in our lab included molecular neuroscience with respect to alzheimer's disease parkinson's disease the pathophysiology of neurodegeneration aging brain and dementia so we had different types of studies somewhere typically based on certain models so uh, as per today's topic so as you all know that neurodegenerative diseases are now a global health burden 
and this is becoming increasingly more prevalent because due to access to better healthcare facilities the elderly population is increasing globally and what was the very less prevalent condition maybe 20 or 30 years back these all these conditions pertaining to neurodegeneration have become very more common in the recent years so these disorders have diverse pathophysiologies and present with a wide range of disease symptoms including cognitive impairment dementia motor symptoms so treatments are very few and they are very less effective for these disorders so there is a very this is very hot topic of research this neurodegeneration so different models are required for better understanding of the different uh, you know etiopathologies of the disease so that we can develop much better uh, targeted in interventions in these conditions if we see the statistics according to who projections by 2025 about three quarters of the estimated 1.2 billion people aged 60 years and older will reside in developing countries and for every 5 year age group beyond 65 the percentage of people with alzheimer's disease doubles and you know alzheimer's disease is one of the most common causes of uh, sporadic dementia uh, and yet you know the many things whether the causative agent and the targeting uh, the profile the where the drugs are being used they are very limited and they can just sometimes halt the disease progression rather than cure it and the very scary part uh, of it is because i have been associated with uh, this dementia clinic which is present in bangur institute of neuroscience which is associated with sskm hospital is that uh, pre previously we had the notion that people above the age of 60 or 65 were having this cognitive decline this uh, memory failure but even the people having uh, who are, who are have, within the age group above 50 uh, they are also nowadays presenting with such complaints and this includes very active minds like principals of schools and professors and i have seen patients who have just uh, forgotten so this is a very alarming thing that in the recent uh, years due to several factors uh, even comparatively a decade younger people are suffering from this neurodegenerative disease these are just an estimate so we can just skip to that so we are not so important so the common way to study uh, about how a disease works is to develop a model system that focuses on the underlying mechanisms of the hallmark characteristics of the disease so we have many experimental model uh, animals or organisms which have been used worldwide for over the years to study the mechanism some of them include the raw rat uh, normal mouse or mice or sometimes we have transgenic mice which are uh, experimentally induced we the genes are modified fruit fly you know is very drosophila is a very very common uh, uh, many insect which is studied it has the genes are very easy to study zebra fish and the nematode worm the c elegans so many labs are working with them baker fish and also the cell culture model so there are some certain cell lines which are typical or which have been accepted as uh, classical uh, for studying the different mechanisms and these have conventionally been studied across the globe and some all of them have their advantages and disadvantages the so majority of the labs are working in one or two of these model systems depending on there are lots of things the conditions of the lab the expenses are very important for example transgenic mice are very expensive to maintain and for experimentation for the, for that reason not all labs uh, can afford such thing but ordinary rat mouse fruit fly zebra fish uh, i think so many have been 
IICB also a lot of work is done uh, with zebra fish. So in our lab, basically, uh, we mainly had two models of uh, to study neurodegeneration. One was the animal model, where we had uh, Charles Foster and Wister rats. So these are typical strains of rats, and uh, what even though I did not work mainly on the animal models, the main theme of the work was that we were working on some uh, cocktail. I mean, we often associate cocktail with drinks, but here we had the cocktail of antioxidants. And that was being fed to the rat for a particular period of time. And then they were sacrificed. And then their uh, brains uh, were studied. For different parameters. So our lab also had specialized uh, this mitochondrial lab and we are measuring the different uh, parameters associated with it. So the brain, mainly the hypothalamus and the corpus callosum and those parts which are uh, essential for cognitive decline, those areas were carefully dissected and several studies were being done. So here what we are doing, we are seeing the effect of the antioxidant uh, therapy, which might have any impact on the progression of neurodegeneration. So this was one field of work. And second was the cellular model. So personally, I was uh, more involved in working with the cellular models. And uh, we had two cell, cell lines, and of which I was working in a neuroblastoma cell line, SHSY5Y. And these cells are, uh, you know, this neuroblastoma means they are cancer cell lines, yet uh, they are adherent cell lines, and they are uh, uh, established cell lines for studying different diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So initially, uh, we had to learn the technique of cell culture. So it was basically a big challenge initially because just maybe six months back, I was working as a house staff in Arjikor, uh, moving or shifting the ventilators and managing patients. And from that, to a very controlled environment uh, where cell culture, as I think many of you might be knowing, is very sensitive because it is very vulnerable for getting contaminated. And once it gets contaminated, be prepared to bear the wrath of all your seniors entire work will be impeded of the lab and uh, all cell cultures have to be thrown away uh, and the room has to be fumigated and again you have to start from the beginning. So it is very very sensitive uh, like uh, as sensitive as maybe the scrubbing in case of orthopedic patients uh, where it is sensitive for infection. Uh, so naturally, uh, gradually, I trained up with this uh, cell culture, how to maintain the cell lines. Uh, so it is a tedious job and uh, every day you have to come see how much the cell has growth, you have to change media. Now when the cells are ready, uh, they provide a very nice medium for experimentation, right? Whatever compounds we want to test, whatever theories, we develop certain hypotheses. We, uh, you know, we are working with Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So very common theory or pathway was the amyloid cascade hypothesis, where we know that certain misfolded proteins like the A beta are responsible for AD. So this is the established theory from post-mortem brains of people who have already suffered the disease. But there are some other challenging theories. Uh, arising from the concept that the amount of these neurofibrillary tangles or A beta, I'm using these technical terms, maybe if you're not familiar, these are certain pathological changes seen in the uh, brain. And these were not proportional to the amount of dementia seen in the patient. And that led to the question that whether it is at all the only factor or the only determining factor in the progression of disease. So as clinicians, you know, we are seeing patients helpless. They are forgetting, I mean, professors are forgetting the, I've seen, you know, the certain charts we give to patients in dementia clinic to assess, it is called the mini mental score. 
MMSE, and we give a score out of thirty. Where they are asked even to draw a circle, they cannot identify a circle as a circle, or a triangle as a triangle. Or there are some questions, very simple questions, like uh, the national flag, or say about Gandhi or Nehru. Very, very uh, common things. and they also lose orientation to time place and date what date it is where they are so very simple things uh, so we make a scoring and this cognitive impairment uh, our main target whenever we get a patient is to halt it so this is only possible if we you know it can still uh, find out the exact pathophysiological pathways which are uh, truly responsible for it so apart from this uh, amyloid theory which we had a very long old age old theory newer models of you know metabolic stress are coming up there are uh, metabolic stress means uh, we are all familiar with diabetes so we have no type 1 and type 2 of diabetes there is another thing which is called type 3 diabetes where you know there is Uh, glucose and insulin dysregulation in the brain, and this causes uh, neurodegeneration. And apart from this glucose and insulin, there are several other factors which have come up, like certain peptide hormonal signals, like including leptin, adiponectin, and other parts, which uh, which may be a factor in this disease. and based on that see this is just uh, the pictorial representation in the left of the cell line which we use just in uh, normal this is a neuroblastoma cell line you can see there are some processes and in the right these are the uh, vista rad which are kept in the uh, lab they are fed with adequate amount of food and this water and their food was usually mixed or with this uh, antioxidant cocktail which i was referring so my work was mainly on this uh, cell line the uh, the other phd's and uh, some of the other md students were working with the animal house as well so theme was same but we are testing at different thing so this was my uh, cell culture lab you see the co2 incubator and this was at icjmr uh, so i just given the uh, heading of the some some of the important publications uh, so we were testing with dopamine cytotoxicity so in, this was in parkinson disease uh, so we were giving treatment with dopamine and we were seeing the different damages at what levels they were causing damages what were the genes that were involved what other molecules like we have this molecule called alpha synuclein and we had some uh, we did some knock down experiments uh, we did uh, you know there are certain genes the amyloid precursor protein and the base and all these proteins which we were regulating so basically we were uh, giving experiment uh, experimenting by treating with certain chemicals which are known triggers of the disease and we were trying to protect it here also in dopamine cytotoxicity we were using certain antioxidants like n acetyl cysteine and all that and seeing whether that reverses the process of neurodegeneration and how we see the neurodegeneration we were seeing the oxidative damage markers we were seeing mitochondrial dysfunction we were seeing gene upregulation so certain gene upregulation is deleterious for or harmful for the neurons to survive and those genes we were seeing by real time pcr now real time pcr has become a household name due thanks to corona at that time it wasn't that so now we all know for corona we are screening for this spike protein and so much so many things but uh, so we can study gene expressions uh, by this uh, uh, thing so we are adding certain chemicals maintaining the cells and certain conditions and then uh, we are you know taking the mrna iso isolating mrna from the cells 
then making cdna and then ultimately doing gene expression and seeing which genes are being expressed more or less uh, with this so this was the basic theme so certain group uh, experiments and uh, we were carrying out and along with this so you can see the cytotoxicity of dopamine on cultured cells of neural origin has been used as a tool to explore the mechanisms of dopaminergic neurodegeneration in parkinson's disease in the current study we have shown that dopamine induces a dose dependent 10 to 40 micromolar and time dependent up to 96 hours loss of cell viability associated with mitochondrial dysfunction and increased intracellular accumulation of alpha synuclein in culture dshs by 5y cell so we have different mechanisms of studying mitochondrial dysfunction we do some protein blotting we do some enzyme markers uh, with different method we see cytotoxic cell death we study cell death we also do some uh, fluorescence spectroscopy like that we have certain markers of apoptosis and necrosis as well so uh, we studied so basically this is technical thing we can skip so uh, interestingly uh, we can see that uh, the dopamine effects of cell viability and mitochondrial function were significantly prevented by knocking down a particular gene that is alpha synuclein expression and how we do it we have something known as the si rna you know a few years back the nobel prize was for this si rna and uh, we are using this as commercial kit where we can you know knock down certain genes with a kit which is uh, we incubate the cell with that and then we can see the effects of particular genes or products based on that knock down study so this was this work and secondly in case of this is another publication based on alzheimer's disease uh, i think podana boshen has one question we can uh, take the question later or uh, just up, now up, up to you like um, i just have a regular question about uh, for a neurogenerative diseases what is the usual steps of finding a cure or something that can uh, reduce the spread of the disease let's say or it's just so, like to understand the different steps you have to go through to find uh, some solution to that disease okay so the i will take it at the end uh, yes. i will just uh, let me finish uh, the, this thing uh, the multiple mechanisms is another publication uh, showing the iron induced amyloid beta peptide accumulation in shsy 5 by cells so here we studied the toxic effects of iron uh, so we are basically we are studying some endogenous molecules and their effects uh, in the neurodegeneration and here also we have this iron induced neurodegeneration in uh, certain pathways are there and which we studied and there is another compound called negletin which is found to be reversing the effects of those iron mediated damages so metabolic stress as i was telling can again be due to other endogenous molecules like dopamine the iron etc are all present normally within the uh, system so whether certain uh, dysregulation of this compound can precipitate or activate the neuro neuronal cell death that was the uh, theme of investigation and later on uh, i think we worked this this was with the clinical samples we took the blood of patients coming to dementia clinics and we saw certain pro inflammatory cytokines and like interleukins nowadays again you know with corona the il6 estimation is very popular so these pro inflammatory cytokines were also shown to be correlated with uh, alzheimer's disease and how we correlated with the severity was uh, we took mini mental score examination of uh, the different patients and graded the severity of alzheimer's based on the uh, uh, mmsc score so as mild moderate and severe 
and there we found certain correlation with this pro inflammatory cytokine and also they were supposed you know all these uh, patients of alzheimer's disease some suffered from depression as well so it also had certain correlation of these uh, cytokine so these are again this was an approach to find out certain biomarkers for predicting the spread of the i mean for uh, predicting the intensity of the disease and whether this pro we can measure this pro inflammatory cytokines quite easily nowadays and uh, whether their level serum level can uh, give us some idea about the disease progression and its relation with certain other neuropsychiatric conditions like depression so uh, basically uh, now the project which i have written uh, in dsp after joining aims uh, is basically to see how the other metabolic stress factors like glucose energy hypermetabolism uh, can bring about neuronal death and secondary changes in amyloid beta metabolism and tau phosphorylation in alzheimer's disease to explore the role of endogenous substances like leptin and adiponectin or alternative energy substrates so we induce this uh, glucose energy hypermetabolism by you know using alternate substrates like uh, two deoxy glucose instead of glucose uh, and uh, there are certain other compounds as well and uh, then we see what are the changes in the different parameters the mitochondrial functions the cell death and etc and uh, this is what uh, the future directions Uh, we am i am personally planning to work so mainly i am now concentrating on the cell culture work and then i can focus on uh, the parameters related with clinical samples once our opd and the neuro department start functioning at aim server yeah yeah thank you so this is the uh, projected building it is still under construction the main site of uh, Uh, in Devgar, where I'm currently working, and today was the supposed inauguration of a part of the building by the Honorable Health Minister, but everything was delayed. In fact, uh, there are a lot of COVID cases in our campus, and uh, the students have all been sent back home, and we are also been asked to uh, teach from home and take online classes at the moment. Yes, uh, coming back uh, to the uh question uh, just can you repeat once uh yes yeah, yeah, so just to uh, understand uh, you know for somebody who is not from the field uh, is um, let's say you have a neurodegenerative disease and you want to find the cure right cure or just to slow it down right the way the right. progression right. so what what is the usual um, like uh, phases of research and how long does it take to let's say even if you find a solution how long it does it take uh, like clinical trials and what you know just to know the whole you know See, there are uh, different phases and no particular disease so all have individual approaches so if we understand the pathophysiology uh, very quickly for example if we have so first whenever we have the disease we recognize it by symptoms then we correlate back to which system it is mainly affecting so here the system failure is mainly say the cognitive decline and memory loss so we know the areas of the brain which are mainly involved in this function in parkinson's disease we have certain you see the motor dysfunctions and there are tremors rigidity disturbance in walking that is gait gait disturbances so when the patient walks in you can identify whether the classical symptoms have begun or not. yeah so naturally uh, so different phases are there and um, so first so we find out which system is being affected and then based on that the strategies are developed what models we can study on that because in certain cases like the brain we cannot 
uh, do a biopsy and study directly it ha- mainly they are based on studies of autopsy that is only after death mm. so that poses a bit of a challenge and wa- once we find what are the causative agents so it may take several years to just to find the pathophysiology of diseases like if you remember there are certain diseases like the prion diseases to establish that a prion or a infectious protein can cause such disease it took 20 to 30 years of the different scientists to find out what was the cause of the disease nobody could know the cause of this wasting and uh, in this tribals you know the cannibals practice the human uh, brain eating uh, this thing uh, ritual and why this is happening uh so all diseases are individual and then once we find the cause then we are trying to find some cure we find the therapies and then the trial you know the the computer power is too low i guess we have currently lost our uh, speaker temporarily so i guess he'll uh shall we have more we'll have more questions for him i have also several questions but i think uh we are pretty much uh you know uh, in into the into the uh, program so maybe we'll we can move on to the next panelist and later we can come back to uh, dr ganguli again so our next uh, panelist uh, professor ashita prosina would you like to you know maybe say a few words initially and then uh describe how your research takes builds on the work as i perceive if i'm wrong please correct me but as i perceive it builds on the experimental work done by biologists and what how you take that and make uh biophysical models and maybe how that is taken up by engineers and other um other other people in other area to make research work in their fields so professor sinha uh yeah the bar so um the thing is that you know uh, as a physicist we have the luxury of uh, working on models that uh, could span a whole range of scales and you know ideally we would like to work on something which takes inputs from biologists or you know whatever results they have and gets results which you know one can test in silico so so maybe it could be taken up in some kind of uh, implementation in terms of engineering so um, i guess the best example of that would be by looking at an actual example which i guess would be the content of the uh, you know like the later 15 minute uh, you know summary of each one's uh, research topic so um i would take up the other po- point that you raised uh, about you know like what actually led to uh, the particular kind of research that i do today so um you know till uh, you know, my class 12 i guess like most jb scholars who have gone into science i was fascinated by astronomy and you know carl sagan's cosmos was in a sense and you know like a revelation for us when it was telecast in in the television around 1985 or so and you know, i just wanted to be you know a phd student of carl sagan you know if if anyone asked me at that time what do you want to be you know da i mean you know that is that's a stupid question right I, who wouldn't want to be a student of carl sagan right so um but you know in uh, 89 just about the time i got into my undergrad three things happened which kind of you know completely changed the course of my life i came across three books complete accident I found this book by Patricia Church then called Neurophilosophy which basically made the point that you can understand the mind as an emergent process of the chemical process that is going on in the brain which was a very very different way of looking at you know the mind from the you know usual other ways of going into philosophy and so on so I I thought you know wow and and you know especially Patricia was talking about Richard Feynman in a book and saying that you know philosophers who uh you know ignore the science of their day are doomed to you know basically rehashing you know centuries old ideas um and then simultaneously with that i came across the biography of alan turing by andrew hodge uh, which of course now is very popular because of the movie on turing you know starring um, uh, benedict cumberbatch and so on but uh, at that time you know um 
Turing was not that well known a name. And what really fascinated me was, you know, it was the end of this book uh, when Andrew Hodge discusses the concept of the Turing test, the fact that, you know, you can divorce mind from the biological substrate in which it is based. And I thought that's cool. I mean, uh, you know, wow, I didn't even know that, you know, you could actually divorce the mind from the brain, so to say. Uh, let's, let's look into this in a bit more detail. And, um, you know, that's how I started reading popular books on uh, artificial intelligence. And then along came another book, James Gleick's Chaos, which, you know, completely blew apart everything that I knew about physics until then. And it says that, you know, you can have a system which is completely determined and you will never be able to predict what's going to happen in the future. I said, hold on a sec. Isn't that what mind, you know, mind's mystery is all about? You know, people say that, you know, physics can't really explain the mind because, you know, it's unpredictable. But here's, here's a physic, physical system which, you know, you can write down all the differential equations. You can specify the initial conditions and you will never be able to know what it's going to do in the future. So, you know, these three books coming together, you know, coincidentally, you know, in the same short span of time made me start thinking and... Luckily enough, I got the JBs uh, at that, exactly at that time. And Misha Shen, Mashima, you know, so she was, you know, essentially transformed my life. So, you know, here I was thinking about all these ideas and very cockily, I told her, you know, I've figured out what the mind is all about. It's a chaotic, you know, physical system. Uh, you know, all that is left is, you know, just f this little matter of showing that I'm right to the rest of the world. And Mashima, instead of laughing at me, she said, you know, why don't you give a presentation to the JB scholars? And she, bought, uh, she brought, uh, you know, uh, Topan Goshal from Jadapur University, who was a professor of electrical engineering uh, and a former JB scholar himself to, you know, like be the ex external expert. Well, um, I don't remember much about, you know, what nonsense I spewed there, but something actually positive came out of that. Rudra Dotto, who was two years my senior and who was, in fact, actually spoken in one of these JBS PDF meetings already. Uh, after the talk, he came over to me and said that, uh, you know, um, have you read this book? Have you read that book? And so on. And, you know, we formed a great friendship. And, you know, it's, it's often uh, not appreciated how much uh, in JBN STS, you know, friendships between scholars, either of the same year or, or of different years, actually have, you know, help them mature as scientists. And for me, this friendship I had with Rudro, you know, for about two or three years, you know, when he was still in Kolkata and then, you know, for a time after he went to IAC for his uh, master's, it made an enormous difference. And Rudro kind of, you know, started getting me interested in lots of different things, you know, in, into computer science. You know, he basically said that, look, the problem of the brain mind is not just something which is a physical problem or just a biology problem. Essentially, it's very much to do with computer science. Something, of course, I appreciated given that, you know, I was already fascinated by the Turing test. And then Mashima kind of arranged for me to do a summer at Indian Institute of Science, um, you know, when I was at the end of my undergrad. And there I had another former JB scholar, Professor Chandan Das Gupta. I think he's 1960s batch or thereabouts, who um, was my mentor. And I kind of learned for the first time what actually doing research meant. You know, it's so say spewing that you know, things like, you know, oh, the brain is a chaotic attractor is one thing. Actually getting your hands dirty, trying to, you know, like get a program written, actually trying to figure out what kind of program would even show, you know, some aspects of this, you know, brain being chaotic attractor concept. That actually really, you know, brought me down to ground, so to say. So then... Um, from uh, 94 to 98, I was a PhD student at ISI Kolkata. And essentially, I had the fortune of having an advisor who was very confident in my abilities. And he let me be. He just, you know, he told me, that, well, you know, as long as you don't make a fool of yourself, you're free to do what you want. Just go and knock yourself out. So I was very lucky that he had so much confidence in me. And, you know, I had fun, great fun, you know, working out all kinds of ideas on, you know, could chaotic attractors explain certain aspects of the brain and you know, had uh, fun talking to computer scientists, talking to biologists, 
and you know, Kolkata was actually a great inter- you know place of intellectual ferment at that time. I, I don't know about now. I have not been really in contact with uh, uh, you know that circle for a while. But uh, at that time, you know, you could drop in in any of these institutions like Shah Institute. or let's say jadavpur university or bose institute and you could talk to people like you know dr indrani bose uh, professor bikash chakraborty uh, tapan goshal and so on and you know you could, you could really you know uh, bounce ideas of them steal ideas from them and basically make something of personal out of your own and so then uh, you know uh, after four years of this uh, you know even even if you're doing something you will really love you know phd is not towards the end great fun because you know you suddenly realize that you have to do a dissertation right and so you know like you get your nose on the kind of stone and grindstone and you know you have to turn out your thesis at the end and uh, well after that you're so sick of the whole thing that you just don't, don't want to do it for the next few years so that's what happened right so for my postdoc i decided to consciously steer clear of you know everything i worked on in my phd worked on pattern formation cardiac dynamics uh, got into complex networks but funnily enough you know it all turned out to be a preparation for the next phase of my computational neuroscience work so when you know in 2002 i joined uh, institute of mathematical sciences i you know, again started getting interested in the brain and i suddenly realized that all these things are that i thought i had done to escape from neuroscience they are in a sense you know helping me to get a better grasp and from in a very abstract way of looking at the brain which is what i was doing when i was a phd student you know essentially uh, one biologist with whom i was once uh, explaining my phd work uh, famously stopped me at some point and said hold on where's the body i said what what <laughs> body and you know like and then i realized that actually you know for a biologist this whole point of you know talking about you know something about explaining the brain without any reference to the physiology of it sounds like you know heresy right and so so you know i, I and i of course you know being a very uh, cocky youngster at that time i thought you know biologists are such idiots so anyway so uh, but you know you start appreciating you know such few points when you as you gradually get older and so uh from 2002 onwards essentially uh when i started forming my own group i started looking into the problem of the brain mind with more you know listening more towards what balizas had to say um so i kind of focused on two aspects of it one is uh, looking at the nervous system of a fairly you know lowly organism the worm uh it's uh, organism called the cynorhabditis elegans uh it has you know order of 1000 cells which makes up its entire body a third of which are neurons and the big advantage of this organism is that we know not only its entire genome we also know where all the neurons are which neuron is talking to which neuron so in a sense we know its circuit diagram and uh a mentor of mine because chakraborty of science institute of nuclear physics once said to me it was the end of my phd that look you know you guys are all trying to understand the human brain and you don't know even like you know a fraction of its wiring diagram shouldn't you start focusing on you know explaining the worm it has 300 neurons you know its entire wiring diagram if you can't figure out how the brain of this worm makes its mind what makes you confident that you will be able a, able to explain the human brain so i thought yeah that's really a challenge right so so i kind of you know started focusing on trying to understand this uh, particular organism and um, you know for the last 15 years or so uh, a lot of the effort of my group has focused on trying to understand how the neural circuitry of this organism helps figure out its behavior you know this this worm unlike you know a fancy robot made by you know some japanese company actually has to survive out in the wild it cannot uh, depend on you know some kind of you know uh, fixed uh, environment every all the time you know the environment around it is changing hostile forces are trying to kill it and it's surviving nevertheless so what gives it its adaptability what gives it its robustness 
we really need to understand that. And so, you know, we try to essentially figure out whether the structure of the network, the, the network which connects all these neurons, uh, gives it certain advantages. Does it allow more efficient information processing, for example? Does it allow it to, um, you know, in some sense, compensate for noise in its environment? Uh, how does the nervous system talk to its um, uh, effectors, to its motor system? How do the muscles get controlled by the uh, nervous system? So, you know, the, our dream is that eventually we will come up with a simulator where you would be able to see this worm, this, you know, worm within the computer, sense some simulated food and be able to walk towards it. And contrarily, be able to figure out that something noxious is out there and be able to move out of it. If we can actually realize that, that would be in some sense, you know, the great success of our research program. Um, and um, parallel to it, we also work a lot, of course, on uh, primate uh, nervous systems. And this is basically to see whether what we are learning from the worm is something which is universal. You know, you know, that's my hang up as a physicist. You know, as physicists, you're always trained that, you know, don't focus on particulars. Try to come up with universal organizing principles. Ideally, you should get something like Newton's gravitational law, right, which applies to an apple and to planetary systems and to the universe. So, you know, what are the universal organizing principles of the, you know, neuronal networks? What are the principles which unify uh, a network of 302 neurons and something as big as 10 to the power 12 neurons, which is the human brain. So, so we look at you know, the uh, network of brain regions uh, of the macaque, which is in some sense one of the most well-studied primate brains. And more recently, we've also been looking at human brains because you know, uh, for a long time, the problem with studying human brains was that you know, the only way you could actually do this very detailed uh, you know, mapping of the networks connecting brain regions is actually dissect a brain. So with primates, of course, you know, you do a lot of uh, uh, work which is strictly not kosher with the animal rights lobby. So you inject the brain with lots of tracers and then, you know, kill or sacrifice it, as they prefer to say. And then you dissect the brain and, you know, figure out, you know, uh, this, this tracers basically help you to delineate the connections between one brain region to another. And so in this way, you can actually make up a fairly detailed map of the pathways which connect the different brain regions. So, you know, in the end, you have a basically a network. Uh, for humans, of course, this is a no-no, but uh, over the last 10 years, uh, you know, you have got uh, an enormous revolution in uh, brain mapping, which actually allows you to do that without, you know, any, you know, harmful effects to the subject. And so you are actually have a gradually, you know, growing database of such structural brain networks of subjects, you know, ranged across ages, ranged across gen gender and so on. You have healthy subjects versus subjects suffering from various kinds of disorders. And so what we do is we look at the networks and try to figure out uh, what are the commonalities between uh, the brains of different subjects to try to figure out what is the master plan of the human brain. So to say, the idea is that, you know, there would be some aspects of the network, which is variable and some aspects which are essentially common across subjects, which in some sense, you know, uh, underpinning the basic functions of the human brain. And so what we do is we try to look at the network. We try to infer all these, you know, common properties. And in the end, we try to see whether the kind of features, network features that we see in the salience nervous system for example, are in some sense reflected also in the primate nervous system. So you know, that's kind of what our current goal is. Okay, thank you. So do you want to share some more like specific results uh, now or? Uh, so I, I thought we are going to get into that after uh, or in sure, this so, uh, brief five sure. minutes. So, uh, so yeah. uh, maybe Professor Basu, do you want to speak uh, similar lines, how you came to uh, this you know, research why this interests you, and uh, and and how how you have your research maybe you know influenced by biologists, uh, and so on. 
sure uh, thanks thanks Devago. uh so i can also probably start uh, a little bit by uh, how i came into this research so i think uh, during my undergrad days at uh, iit kharagpur uh, we had a very interesting vlsi or chip design lab there which was kind of one of its kind one of the best in the country at that time and uh, i think padanavada here was our senior there uh, and uh, i think so at that time we really understood a lot about chip design which later on i realized most students are doing that during their phd so essentially the chip design part we kind of knew all the nuts and bolts already so for me when i started my phd i was always very interested in maths so i wanted to do something related to maths and then i came across you know this field of uh, chaos again like shita broda uh, said earlier it's fascinating and so i started working on chaos and nonlinear dynamics my phd advisor at georgia tech was also very interested in math so he just let me do whatever i felt like so i did start doing courses in math i did a masters in math in nonlinear dynamics but eventually what happened is uh, what i realized is i would like to somehow connect all of these uh, math knowledge back into uh, what i was originally doing in my undergrad which i was passionate about as well like circuits and so it turned out that uh, in my lab we used to have these students who would do rotations um, and and these had a particular type of scholarship called igert in the us where you could uh, neuro essentially neuroscientists they could actually do rotations in several labs and uh, i had a couple of good friends in that uh, in that uh, domain so i realized that there's a huge amount of uh, a uh, huge amount of application of chaos nonlinear dynamics theory to this domain of understanding brains and computational neuroscience and for me then uh, what i wanted to do then is somehow use the math to connect circuits with computational neuroscience so essentially what what i did at that time uh, was kind of use some theory of nonlinear dynamics to simplify a lot of these brain equations brain dynamics equations so that you could map them into circuits very easily and that opened up a lot of new applications for example we could make simulators that could run much faster than standard digital computers we could also then use these kind of chips to interact live with other biological tissue through some kind of closed loop systems and essentially from then on uh, i just started having you know lot lot lots and lots of more questions the more i progressed so i kind of stuck to this area and i guess one of the books that really uh, influenced me uh, i would say uh, would be a book by a guy called eugene isikevich uh, he wrote a wonderful book on dynamical systems in neuroscience which i think uh, a lot of lot of people here would probably be able to appreciate there are other books by hoppenstead and so on which are a little bit more uh, tricky to read but i think eugene's book is a very nice intro and also if you are interested in chaos and nonlinear dynamics i think you should definitely look at the book by steven strogatz it's this kind of a uh, wonderful place to start so i think uh, with all of that uh, i kind of had this uh, broad outlook spanning you know maths then neuroscience and then uh, chip design and then when i started my own lab at ntu uh, from 2010 uh, my hope was to somehow work a lot more on um doing these closed loop systems where i could potentially have my artificial uh, neural network interact uh, live with uh, you know biological neural networks and so we started a big program in doing um uh, this brain machine interfaces which actually have a big clinical impact as well so for example patients who are locked in or paralyzed uh like tetraplegics for example they potentially can't move their arms or legs but uh part of the brain that's responsible for these thoughts like the motor cortex might still be active so we were starting to look at you know these kind of artificial neural networks can we use them to decode the thoughts in the motor cortex and use those to uh, kind of you know give a new lease of life to these patients so so that that's been uh, again a consistent theme that we have been working uh, on it for the last you know 10 years ish currently we are doing uh, experiments on primates and we are going to start on humans pretty soon but you know going to humans is always a pretty big step so, so we are taking our time on that uh, apart from that of course you know uh, if you have uh, been in this competitive academic world you know that we always have to go and look for the dollars so in terms of looking for funding again uh, 
I think uh, we had to diversify a little bit and also look at other applications. So we do a lot of work, uh, part of which I'll show later, that has relevance to robotics. For example, if you think about how our brains really developed, I think a lot of it has to do with um, sensory motor control. So you get some input from sensors, you process it, and you have to quickly do some motor action. So it's, again, a closed loop system. If you look at robotics today, that's essentially sort of one of the big problems that you're trying to solve. So sensory motor loops. So uh, essentially, we started applying a lot of our uh, devices for uh, robotics applications. And separately, uh, what potentially I'll show later on during our talk as well is even if you look at just the sensory pathways, even if you look at just the retina or just the cochlea for the ear, uh, these are actually fantastic signal processing engines. So you could use them even for uh, you know, other standard applications where people typically use, let's say, computer vision to track an object. If you use a sensory front end, that's more like the biological front end, you start seeing a lot of advantage, especially in uh, tackling issues like, you know, uncertainties, occlusion, and so on. So basically, that's, that's kind of uh, where our group is working on at the moment. Uh, we do a lot of work starting right from circuits to algorithms to systems. We personally don't do a lot of devices, though in the last you know, five, 10 years, there's been a huge amount of interest in um, like material science to look at brain and try to mimic parts of the brain like synapses and neurons and so on. Uh, so we work again a lot with material scientists who come up with these kind of devices. And then we try to see if we can somehow again use dynamical system theory or some other way to map the properties of these devices to uh, neural networks uh, in silico. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so again, in our case, I think uh, our philosophy is, yeah, I think brain is very much embodied. So we won't, don't want to separate it from the body as uh, Dr. Sina was saying. So uh, maybe it will make for interesting discussions later on. So I think I'll keep it short for now and uh, I'll stop here. Okay. Yeah. One, I guess, uh, uh, to, to my uh, understanding, your research has multiple, multiple avenues, but uh, you started with this chip design that was inspired by brain. So maybe one quick question is why, why, why do you think the chip design inspired by brain would be better than what existed? Or do you want to speak about that in your presentation? I mean, I can give a quick uh, overview. So, I mean, uh, the, it's sort of the proof is in the pudding in the sense that, you know, we know that we are doing a lot of stuff very nicely, very easily. Uh, that current algorithms in machine learning or signal processing, we're not able to solve well. Uh, standard examples people give are, for example, the cocktail party problem. Uh, if you're not familiar, it, it's something like, you know, if you're talking with somebody else in a, in a busy room, where it's party going on, a lot of sound, somehow we can still very easily filter out what the other person is saying, right? And if you look at signal processing, speech processing algorithms, this is a serious pain point for any artificial uh, speech processing system. We don't know why that is the case, right? So essentially, you know, we can see there are so many n number of things that we biological organisms can do very well. So it makes sense for us then uh, to kind of get inspiration from the uh, biological piece and then kind of copy it over, maybe not exactly, but at least copy over some of the principles to uh, make uh, chips that would work potentially like the biological piece itself. Okay, I'll probably follow up with other questions in, along these yes. lines. For example, why, but, but we can come to that later, but I'll just state the question is yeah. that why, why in that case did, do you think people did not start with this kind of uh, circuit design earlier? Was that uh, like, uh, but I guess we can keep that uh, suspense I mean, for I a bit can, and we can- Again, uh, yeah, yeah, we that can, question if you want, it's a, it's a, it's a continuous flow. So uh, what happens in the chip design industry, it's, it's largely driven by, uh, I mean, as, in most industries, given by money, right? So you would like to accelerate the rate at which you're doing chips, right? At which you're progressing as fast as possible so that you don't, you know, um, fall behind your competitors. So what happened in the 80s and 90s was uh, digital circuit design got a big boost because of uh, design automation. You could essentially automate a lot of the circuit design, whereas analog circuits, even now it's, you know, difficult to automate. I mean, I've seen a lot of people doing PhDs on this and it's still you know, not, not, not very well done. So uh, essentially that's where the big difference came. The automation process in digital circuits, whereas the 
the brain inspired circuits that we are talking about are largely analog in nature uh, potentially looking at you know if you even look at the brain you are looking at continuous time differential equations so you have something like you know a continuous time system um, and you're looking at you know continuous variables like currents ion concentrations and so on so it's like if you translate it to circuits it's an analog circuit so since automation was not that easy to do digital circuits just you know crushed everything else so people just started following digital circuits for that reason but what happened in the last you know 10 15 years uh, people started talking about moore's law stopping moore's law is the law that makes transistors in, it's not a law really but it's like a trend that test transistors are going to become smaller and smaller so your digital circuits are just going to get more and more efficient over time but if that stops then you have to start improvising right you have to start thinking out of the box and the second thing that happened last 10 years was you know this huge boom of neural networks that that kind of came up so people started really thinking about okay neural networks and these kind of algorithms it's important to make accelerators or special chips for these kind of algorithms again so that's where again the brain inspiration comes in because you know pattern recognition machine learning is sort of a basic thing that all the brains are good at doing so that, that's where again you start seeing a renewed interest in analog design for uh, these kind of applications right thanks so i think uh, uh, professor poddana washen has a question uh, shall we take that quickly quick question yeah so maybe uh, basu you can uh, say the, that later but uh, i have two questions one is about uh, the energy efficiency of the brain as much as i understand our brain is way more energy efficient than anything you know many orders different than all this Uh, chips and anything possible in next ten twenty years. How you think about it? And second, when you talk about sensor, right? Uh, so sensory, even uh, motor control. So latency. How do you compare? Like, uh, let's say um, we try to you try to create some system to enable, let's say, a disadvantaged kid or a person, right? and uh, they are you are trying to emulate the sense and then react kind of system right and maybe our brain or maybe the motor functions are much faster that may not be emulated uh, so this is about the it's a question of latency right so first is a question of energy efficiency second is a question of latency okay thanks thanks for the uh, so yeah first question first uh, in terms of energy efficiency yes that has always been one of our you know uh, what should i say motivating factors why we want to look at brain as inspiration apart from being good at algorithms the amount of energy per op seems to be about you know by various uh, like various estimates about you know 100 to 10000 times more efficient than digital processors right so a uh, few reasons for that one is uh, the brain uses a lot of physics for computing so if you are using for example kirchhoff's current law to add two numbers that's almost for free right you just do join two wires together you get a sum for free or if you're using charge conservation you get a sum for free whereas if you want to do that in digital circuits you have this you know 16 bit number you have some adder circuits you move around a lot of bits charge discharge capacitors and get a summation right so inherently for many computational primitives especially those that are being used in neural networks analog or physical computing seems to be very very efficient that's number one number two is conventional digital systems have this separation of uh, memory and computing so so called the von neumann architecture where you take a control from control word from the memory take data from memory do some computation and then write it back to memory what's happening these days is the memory access both read and write is the, the energy for that is becoming very very big because the memory sizes are also increasing you look at neural networks the size of neural networks is increasing so much even just to show the parameters you need a very big memory so then to access even one data from that memory you need to charge discharge big capacitors so essentially that becomes very very energy inefficient in our brains we sort of have this you know compute and memory mixed together so uh, the neurons and synapses are kind of all intermixed so you don't really have this huge extra energy needed to access data per se it's kind of just flowing through the system and the third thing which i could potentially say is biological power supplies if you think about you know reversal potentials of sodium potassium and so on 
biological power supplies are about in you know, a hundred one twenty millivolts. Um, typically, our chips we operate at you know five hundred six hundred millivolts or maybe a, a volt. So that 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 difference in power supply also also matters. So I think these would be some of the reasons that I think you know the um, brain is a lot more power efficient. But indeed, industry is working towards this area. So to get around this memory access problem, people are doing uh, what they currently call in-memory computing. Essentially, the data stays in the memory, and you do some analog processing in the periphery. So that the data can be computed in an analog way within the memory itself. Right? So for us who are doing analog circuits, neural networks for the last you know twenty years or so, uh, I mean this has been what we have been doing. Right? It's just that now the digital guys, the memory guys, are giving it a new name. So indeed, I think this is definitely coming into the industry. Some under a uh, term called in-memory computing. So you know you can watch out for that. Hopefully that will indeed uh, allow us to close the gap a lot. In terms of energy efficiency, uh, the second question you had was Sorry, in terms no, of. Sorry, Professor Basu, can we take the question a little later because I yeah, think sure. we are running a little short of time. So maybe we can first listen to Professor Sinha uh, about how to how this bridging of the gap is happening between biologists and and engineers, probably. So about his design of different networks. So Professor Sinha, please would like to hear from you first. Uh, thanks, Debargo. Um, so, Arindam, fascinating work. Uh, would love to hear more about it. Uh, so, uh, let me just share my screen. Um, uh, is it visible? Any chance? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, do you want to go to the slideshow mode? Probably? Yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah, Thanks. can can you see it now? Yes, yes. Thanks. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, when Anirban was uh, mentioning uh, this, all this molecular biology details. Um, um, and Devarga actually originally had, uh, you know, uh, made this wonderful suggestion that maybe one could show how one goes from molecular biology to uh, you know, network models. Uh, the point is that, you know, the, the challenge of modeling the brain is, of course, it has so many scales at which you can try to understand it. So molecular biology is actually only, in some sense, the smallest skill level at which we can study it. Um, you can study it at the level of synapses, at the level of neurons, level of networks, level of maps, level of systems, at the entire central nervous system. And each of these levels, you know, has its own dedicated science. So, you know, at the level of networks, you have what we would call systems neuroscience. At the level of the entire nervous system, you know, that's what essentially cognitive scientists are studying. And um, one of the goals we have is, of course, to see, is there any way we can actually take information from one scale and make it inform the modeling done at another scale? So um, in some you know, restricted way, that's what we have been trying to do. OK, so since um, you know, my presentation was made in an integrated way where I just also wanted to talk about you know, how um, we got to do what we are doing. You know, this is already something that I have gone across, but I saw that there was a question in the chat about what were the books that I had mentioned. So, you know, uh, so, you know, these are the books I briefly mentioned. And of course the books that are in the mentioned are also essentially the books that I used to teach when I, when I teach courses in uh, uh, modeling uh, neural systems, both the books of Strogatz and uh, Izike, which are actually fantastic books. Uh, but, you know, if you want popular books, which kind of, you know, fire you up your enthusiasm for getting into a field, these are actually wonderful books. And of course, people I already mentioned before, um, you know, Mashima, Rudro and Chandanda, who were actually great moving forces behind our, uh, behind my scientific uh, trajectory. And so in my PhD, what I was mostly doing was essentially focusing on, you know, simple network models, uh, and see if I could get them to uh, 
do chaotic trajectories. And in this, I was inspired by the work done by the neuroscientist Walter Freeman, who essentially uh, had done experiments on the rabbit olfactory system and had shown that um, essentially uh, the dynamics of the neuronal firing in the olfactory bulb is undergoing chaotic trajectories. However, this chaotic trajectory show a very characteristic transition uh, when the rabbit is actually given a known smell versus when it's you know, just smelling you know, some unknown stimuli. And the very radical hypothesis he was forwarding is that essentially chaos allowed you to very quickly converge to a memory of a smell that you already know before. And once you converged onto that particular memory, the dimension of your chaotic attractor was actually reducing. So it was a wonderful picture in which you, most of the time the brain is you know, exploring an extremely high dimensional space. However, when you latch on onto something that you know from before, uh, very quickly, the, the space is reducing to local region around the point in that phase space in which your memory is located. And that's what you would call a recall of an earlier memory. So that's what I was essentially trying to, you know, in some sense, implement using artificial neural networks. And then following, you know, my short hiatus into other areas, uh, complex networks and so on. Um, when I started my own group at IMSC, uh, we started developing a program in network neuroscience, which envisioned in some sense integrating uh, insights coming from very different areas. So basically focusing on the structure of the nervous system. And for this, we mostly use uh, theory of networks, theory of complex networks, uh, dynamics. And here we are looking at the nonlinear dynamics, excitability and function where we are looking at, you know, what possible information processing tasks that the nervous system might be uh, used to solve. And integrating all of this together, we try to solve the problem of how learning in some sense solves the problem of how to self-organizedly create a system which would be able to solve some extremely complicated problems of you know, giving the correct response to some stimuli all the time. So uh, what I uh, decided to use as an example of the way we approach a problem in neuroscience is the question of uh, how is the warm brain wired? You know, I already mentioned synorhabditis elegans, this you know, uh, model organism which has you know, order of thousand cells of which a third are neurons and which is the only organism whose entire neuronal wiring diagram has been completely mapped out. And yet we don't really understand how exactly this wiring diagram comes into being. Uh, so we can say that, you know, um, wouldn't it vary from individual to individual? It does, but to a large extent, there's a, there's a lot of it which is actually predetermined, which means that the architecture is definitely has to do something with the specific functions that the nervous system is supposed to solve. And so the question we are trying to address is, uh, what's the wiring plan? Why do you have that particular wiring plan? And how does the wiring plan come into being? And I already mentioned that, you know, I was inspired by one of my mentors, Vikas Chakraborty, who in 98 told me that, you know, unless we can understand the warm brain, uh, we don't really have a hope in hell to understand the human brain. So um, to give you some specifics about the warm, it's about, uh, uh, so it's essentially a microscopic organism. Uh, however, um, you can um, image the neurons <coughs> and it's a, it's a transparent organism. So you can actually see this, the, you know, the, the fluorescence of the activation of these neurons under a microscope, which makes it, you know, a wonderful organism to look at how the activation of a sensory neuron is allowing the activation of interneurons and thereby activation of motor neurons. So we can actually, in some sense, capture the flow of information across the nervous system. And um, a very rudimentary kind of network analysis will tell you that um, the nervous system is actually 
fairly well connected. So if you look at the strongly connected component, essentially you know that 98% of these neurons have a path, uh, has a connected path to any other neuron in the system. And one of these big questions is that how this you know, works. Like for example, if you had such a densely connected um, nervous system in a higher organism, you will have the problem of how do you localize information? You, know, you don't want, for example, a neuron which is regulating, let's say the laying of an egg to be activated when you really want to activate, let's say the, the motor neuron responsible for moving or propelling the worm towards the source of food. And yet, if you have such a densely connected network, it's very hard to see how you would prevent the stimulation of every single neuron the moment you stimulate one particular neuron in the network. So, uh, you know, apart from those kinds of questions of how the network allows information localization, you also want to link uh, the activation of specific parts of the network to different kinds of functions. So for example, we know which are the neurons which are responsible for specific functions in the worm, like for example, egg laying or its ability to detect temperature or its ability to detect you know, certain chemical cues. Uh, of course, the way that biologists find out which neurons are responsible for this is one could say, you know, is a fairly primitive method. So what you do is you would um, essentially burn away the precursor cells of certain neurons and if the worm dies immediately, you know, obviously the, that cell is very important. But you know, if the worm survives and then you, know, you look at its behavior and you find that, you know, let's say its egg laying behavior is affected. So you would say, well, that particular neuron is actually part of its egg laying circuitry. Or let's say its ability to move is affected. And you'd say that that particular neuron is you know, probably implicated in its locomotory circuit and so on. I mean, of course, it's fairly crude because, you know, it's a bit like saying that you want to understand how a computer works by taking a sledgehammer and you knock out, you know, one circuit board and, you know, say, okay, which part of the computer is not working. You know, most of the time it's not going to work. So, you know, you'd be fairly lucky, you know, if you manage to figure out which neuron is responsible for which circuit. So if you chart out the connectivity of the worm in some kind of a matrix. So this is what we call the connectivity matrix. And there are two connectivity matrices because uh, two neurons can either talk chemically with each other via chemical synapses, or they can talk electrically with each other through what are known as gap junctions. So, you know, you have this two ways that neurons talk to each other. So you have this two connectivity matrices, you stare at it and you ask, okay, do I see any kind of, you know, principles at work here? So how do you actually even start analyzing this connectivity matrix? So of course, uh, you know, in the time-honored tradition of you know, trying to simplify your problem by breaking it into parts, you first ask yourself, can I divide into compartments which are relatively independent of each other or which are, you know, in some sense, uh, this part is consisting of part, you know, components which are fairly strongly connected to each other but are weakly connected to the rest of the network. So um, in the language of networks, what we're asking is that, uh, is the network modular? Well, modules are essentially uh, sub-networks whose connections within you know, their members are fairly dense. And there are you know, much sparser connections between modules. So you know, it, it has the same sense of communities in society where you know, within communities, you'll have very dense interconnectivity, but between communities, you have relatively sparser connectivity. And this is something which we call a mesoscopic or a mesoscale organizational principle, because you are neither looking at some global feature of the network, like you know, the, what's the overall path length or what's the overall clustering. Neither are you looking at you know, microscopic features like motives, where you're just asking questions about how, let's say, two or three neurons are connected to each other. So you're, you're essentially asking questions about you know, groups of neurons, which essentially could be spanning the entire system, but you're asking questions about how are they connected. And sometimes we find that networks which have essentially the same macro feature and the same micro feature, if they differ in terms of their meso feature, they could end up behaving very differently from each other. So, you know, asking mesoscale questions is actually very important when you're trying to understand the function of a network. So uh, what we do find is that, yes, the C. elegans network 
is modular and we can identify uh, six modules, six communities, uh, which have fairly dense intraconnectivity and relatively sparse interconnectivity. Uh, so then the question is, of course, where do these modules come from? So, you know, one glib answer would be, you know, it's, it's embedded in space, right? So obviously the neurons which are close to each other would have far more likelihood of connecting with each other than neurons which are far further apart. But unfortunately, you cannot have such a, you know, uh, you cannot explain away the existence of modules as a trivial outcome of the spatial location of these neurons. Well, you can wear your engineer's hat for a while and you can say, well, maybe the modules are coming about because uh, the network is in some sense optimizing between wiring cost and the communication efficiency. So uh, wiring cost is, of course, you, you don't want to end up, you know, have laying down a dedicated communication line, a dedicated synapse or a gap junction between every pair of neurons. You know, that would, of course, make communication extremely fast across the network, but it's extremely wasteful. On the other hand, if you want to be, you know, extremely cheap, you know, you, you, you just want to, you know, have like a single highway which connects only neighboring neurons, you end up paying the price that to send a signal from any neuron to any other neuron would have to be relayed through lots of intervening neurons. So you would end up, uh, you know, having a very low communication efficiency. It will take a long time for signals to go from any neuron to any other neuron. So obviously it requires some kind of a trade-off. So you could actually, you know, design uh, equivalent randomized networks, uh, essentially having the same number of neurons as C. elegans, same number of connections per neuron as C. elegans, but, you know, having different wiring costs and correspondingly different efficiencies. So if you do such an exercise, you find that you can actually create an optimal trade-off curve, which looks like this. So here, you know, for a given wiring cost, this is the highest efficiency you can get by, you know, essentially trying to shuffle up your network as much as you want. Um, so you might think that, you know, nature would essentially end up with, you know, some point on this curve, but actually the empirical network is somewhere here. And you start thinking, hmm, I mean, that's strange, right? I mean, why is the network suboptimal? Nature can, uh, you know, is it possible that we can actually do much better than nature? Uh, well, the alternative answer is that, you know, there's something else going on. You know, it's not just wiring costs, it's not just communication efficiency. So um, sometime back, we were uh, looking at this problem and uh, we said that, hmm, let, let's try this thing, that maybe some of these neurons are playing various kinds of roles. So some neurons are involved in making sure that communication within a module is occurring very fast. So essentially they're actually acting as community leaders. So they are making sure that everyone within their own community is up to speed on what's going on in the community. There are other uh, entities who actually act as uh, gatekeepers or in some sense uh, making sure that the different communities are in sync with each other. So they are essentially exchanging information between communities. So this is measured by two kinds of measures. One is the intramodular connectivity, which tells you how important a neuron is in coordinating information within its own community. And the other is extramodular connectivity, which tells you what role a neuron is playing in essentially relaying information from one community to another. And in doing this exercise, we found that essentially almost all the neurons which play the role of, you know, connector hubs. So, so connector hubs are essentially, you know, have the best of both worlds. So they are kind of have lots of connection with members of their own community. So they do play a big role in, you know, making sure their people in their own community know what's going on, but they also happen to have lots of key connections with members of other communities. And so they are hubs within their own community they're also connectors because they help different communities to figure out you know, what's going on in the other communities. And we found that almost all of the neurons which you identify as connector hubs are actually involved in one or another of these functional circuits that have been identified by neuroscientists earlier. You know, I, I mentioned some of these uh, you know, functional circuits like thermosensation, chemosensation. So, so almost all of these neurons are actually part of one or another uh, functional circuits. Uh, of the two, which we couldn't actually find in any of the functional circuits, we made a prediction that, you know, maybe they're responsible for some as yet undetermined function. Uh, 
Interestingly enough, another of my students, uh, when he joined, uh, he was interested in working on the primate brain, and um, he started looking at the macaque uh, cortical cortical network. So this is unlike a C. elegans network, which is basically a network of neurons, is actually a network connecting different brain regions with each other. And he essentially asked the same question that we had asked for Synaptitis elegans. He asked that: Is it modular? What do the modules mean? Do they have do they have some kind of a functional significance? And he did exactly the same exercise to find out what would be, in some sense, the brain regions which essentially act as community leaders and which also happen to connect different communities with each other. Um, in short, he found exactly the same kind of structure. But more importantly, he went on to do something you know which we hadn't thought of for C. elegans earlier. So he asked, well, what if I keep exactly the same connectivity as in the original network. So all the brain regions have exactly the same number of connections as in the original network, but you scramble up the connections. So you still have exactly the same number of other brain regions you're talking to, but who you're talking to is scrambled. So if you keep the overall network properties similar, but just scramble up the mesoskill organization, what happens to your information processing efficiency? You know, how fast or how slow do you become? And what he found was that once he scrambled it up, the communication efficiency immediately went down. And this was actually in a way very surprising to us because until then we had believed that a randomized network, which essentially you know, you know, always you know, has a higher wiring cost and a lower communication efficiency would always be the fastest network that you can come up with. And he showed that no, somehow this particular way in which the intra and inter community links coordinate with each other makes information uh, pass through the network more rapidly than you could have done using any other possible connection topology. So this was, you know, in a sense, very exciting. And then we started asking the question, okay, if nature has figured it out, how is it actually being implemented? How is, how is the wiring diagram being laid down? Is it genetic? Um, why is it that you, you know, always this particular wiring diagram, the most efficient wiring diagram, how is it being realized? So in this, we were actually following uh, the pioneering uh, biologist, Sidney Brenner, who in 1974 um, essentially laid down a wonderful program uh, in you know, trying to understand the problem of how the brain um, embodies the mind in the context of C. elegans by asking the following questions. How are the neurons spatially localized? How do they connect to each other? And what governs the temporal sequence in which the different neurons appear? So, you know, uh, we kind of rephrase the questions as a spatial question. Why is the neuron where it is relative to other neurons? A temporal question. Why is it that certain neurons are born much earlier than others? And a topological question. Why does a neuron have the links it does? So um, what we recently have done is essentially try to understand this in terms of some fairly abstract principles. Uh, so what we kind of figured out that essentially the wiring diagram can be explained by just appealing to principles known as homophily. So homophily uh, is kind of an abstract network concept which says that entities which are similar tend to prefer to connect to each other. Uh, so what are these properties? So we find that neurons which have similar process length or neurite length tend to prefer to connect to each other. Neurons which are born at similar times tend, prefer to, uh, tend to prefer to connect to each other. Neurons which are similar in their lineage, which have you know, family re relations with other neurons tend to connect to each other. And neurons which have bilateral symmetry, you, know, you, you can have often neurons which are Paired, so you know, one would be occur in the left side of the body, one would occur in the right side of the body. Even if they don't have family relation, they tend to have a high degree of uh, high probability of connecting with each other. So, since I'm out of time, I won't go into the details of this. You know, but you know, if uh, any of you are interested, you are more than welcome to talk to me uh, afterwards. Uh, so, what uh, we went on to show is that uh, you can actually try to grade the relative importance of these different types of homophily. For example, it uh, appears that symmetric pairing uh, homophily is the one which is most able to explain 
the specific arrangement uh, followed by the birth cohort homophily, that is the uh, you know, family relation homophily followed by process length homophily and lineage. Uh, so how is this actually related to the molecular level details? So what we are doing is basically something which is intermediate between the details at the level of the molecules, because we do understand a lot about how methods like you know, diffusible factors or contact mediated interaction or growth code guidance, all of which is taking place at the molecular level, helps neurons to be guided to connect to other neurons, to the you know, global level where we are trying to understand how the structural organization of the entire somatic nervous system works. So in a sense, what we're trying to do is uncover the guiding principles that govern this wiring and spatial localization of the cell bodies, which are implemented in some sense by the molecular level details. So in this, we are guided by you know, David Murr's uh, philosophy. So David Murr was this computer scientist who you know, tragically died extremely young, but before that he wrote this wonderful book on vision. And uh, in that book, he basically set out uh, a program. He said that, look, to understand a complex system such as the brain, you can't really attack it you know, face on. What you have to do is you've got to divide up your uh, attack strategies. You could attack it at the level of strategies where you ask, what does the system do and why does it do it? You could attack it at the level of algorithms and what are the steps by which the goals are achieved? Or you could attack it at the level of implementation. That is, how are these rep representations or computations physically realized? So what we are doing is basically uncover the strategies for achieving network designs, which is realized over the course of development. And of course, what we'd love to do is delineate exactly how these governing principles are implemented by the molecular mechanisms. So I'd uh, like to thank the, my students, uh, Anand Pathak and uh, my former student, Rajkumar Pan, who were actually the ones who uh, did this work and my collaborator Nivedita Chatterjee who's a neuroscientist who keeps us honest to the neurobiological details and um, you know if you'd like to know more details about uh, these works uh, please do take a look at a few of the papers are listed here. Thank you thank you Professor Sinha we are really running short of time so I'll let uh, I see Professor Rudra Dattu has joined and uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor Roosevelt, you've been a great mentor and friend to Professor Sinha, as he has mentioned. Uh, I'm, uh, we can take one quick question from you if you have one, or I'll ask one question and then we'd like to hear from uh, Professor Basu. So Professor Dr. Reed, would you like to uh, pitch in? Hey folks, I really appreciate the courtesy, but uh, uh, I, I have no questions. I'd just like to say this has been, I joined very late for some reason. I completely missed the notification. So, uh, but I did hear much of uh, uh, Dr. Basu's uh, talk and uh, uh, all of the personas. Um, and uh, it was very pleasant, but very surprising to see my picture turn up. Um, and um, so I, I think he's uh, overstating the mentorship aspect, uh, but I'm very glad <laughs> to have had uh, association with, uh, you know, folks uh, as brilliant as this. And uh, Give you NFTs as a whole. So this is fascinating stuff. And offline, I would like to compare with the the uh, the meta structure that you just talked about, Shitabro. The I am amazed to see that even in my very practitioner and application oriented direction, in which I have uh, drifted in computer networking, the uh, OSPF, the Open Shortest Path First uh, structure that uh, essentially drives the world today in terms of internet working has this group leaders, connection leaders sort of hierarchy that people ended up inventing. So uh, quite surprising. Uh, we can possibly exchange notes on that uh, just out of curiosity. But uh, wonderful to see you folks and uh, hear this stuff. Thanks. Sure, would love to talk about it offline. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Dutton and Professor Sina. So let's hear from Professor Basu and uh, if, if people would like to stick around, we can have more questions. Uh, 
Okay, I hope all, all of you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, I'll, I'll basically talk a little bit about uh, what I discussed earlier, uh, some of the work that uh, we have been doing in our lab uh, at NTU as well as earlier. So it's related to this concept of brain inspired or neuromorphic uh, artificial intelligence. Of course, uh, firstly, I should thank all the students who have done all the work that I'm going to present. Um, and all the funding agencies and so on. So, but uh, broadly speaking, my group is currently doing work, uh, which is at the intersection of uh, brain and electronics. So uh, you can see there's an arrow, big arrow going this way. So we take a lot of inspiration from the brain when we design our artificial systems, but there's also an arrow that's going the other way, which is related to the brain machine interface sort of work that I was talking about, where we actually use a lot of these chips to interface with real brains and uh, make these closed loop systems. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have also uh, kind of drifted a little bit uh, to other applications of these technologies. And I'll show a little, little snippets of these things in the context of Internet of Things um, applications. Okay, so, okay, so uh, I, I broadly broke it up into three, three uh, course uh, categories. F firstly, I wanted to talk a little bit about this term neuromorphic, which uh, these days, if you see, it's, it's very popular. A lot of people are talking about it. So really, the way it started off was, as uh, Padoda also mentioned, it's looking at this energy efficiencies of uh, human brains compared to digital computers. And uh, the term was actually coined by Professor Carver Mead from Caltech, who happens to be my academic grandfather. So uh, what Carver essentially wrote in his uh, paper in, in the 90s was, you know, if you're looking at problems like pattern recognition, where you're really interested in relative values of the variables, like if there's a picture given to me of an animal and I want to know, is it more likely to be a cat or a dog or a mouse? I really want to know, relatively speaking, which one is, you know, most likely. So in that kind of a scenario, that kind of a computational scenario, uh, it actually makes sense not to use very precise digital computers, you know, 32 bit long number representations and so on. Instead, you can do, uh, do a lot with very simple physical computing or analog computing uh, circuits. And in exchange, what you gain is these benefits in terms of energy and area efficiency. So that, that is essentially what I call is neuromorphic version one, which was looking at really the circuits aspect or the hardware substrate. So, so remember this, what Carver was talking about was not the algorithm, right? It was a computational substrate, the actual hardware. Uh, follow the brain the way the hardware is working. Okay, but since maybe the last five or uh, 10 years, there's again been this huge boom of uh, AI and deep learning and deep neural networks and so on. And since then, actually, a lot of other communities have been involved in the research for neuromorphic uh, systems. And now the term neuromorphic has kind of broadened a little bit in connotation. So if you talk with any, anybody in the computer architecture domain, they will talk about a system being neuromorphic if it has a non von Neumann architecture. Okay, and kind of alluded to this a little bit, von Neumann architectures are those where you know, memory and compute is kind of separated and you read stuff from memory, compute, and write back to memory. So architectures that don't have this are more neuromorphic. Also these days in the computer architecture community, people are looking at this very low precision computing. And in that case, people talk about that particular system being neuromorphic, where instead of using a you know, 16 bit or 32 bit word, you use very low precision one, two, or maybe four bits to do computing. Uh, now, separately, if you go to the computer science community, people who are doing algorithms, uh, there somebody will say, you know, uh, a neural network is neuromorphic if it's using uh, differential equations, you know, if the time is intrinsic to the computing, for example, in a spiking neural network, as opposed to traditional artificial neural networks where time is not really represented explicitly. Uh, of course, uh, if your network components are, uh, of course, very bio-inspired, you know, you're looking at uh, details of biology like dendrites, gap junctions, and so on. Uh, then also people would think about that as being a more neuromorphic network as opposed to the traditional computer science abstraction of, you know, uh, some product of some kind of thing. Yeah. The sum of products. So, uh, yeah, if you look at really this uh, neuromorphic research, uh, this is showing a picture from Google Trends. 
uh, for if you if you look at search for this term neuromorphic engineering and what you see is it was really hot in the early 2000s and then really declined and then recently with this new connotation and new set of different scientific communities again getting interested in this brain inspired or neuromorphic work you see now there's a huge rise in uh, neuromorphic research okay so uh, just uh, just to kind of put it in perspective i think i talked about this but in terms of computer architecture when i talk about non von non von neumann architectures this is what i'm talking about you know uh, von neumann architectures have this separation whereas if you are looking at non von neumann architectures then you really look at you know neurons and synapses and synapses are really like memory they have uh, some weights that are stored in it and these are the neurons you can think of them as compute units and they are really like interspersed together right there's not a big separation between the compute and the memory uh in terms of the spiking neural networks if you really want to look at it uh you can think of the spike as being a one bit representation of neuronal activity and uh, the way people think about it is okay there's information coming in to the dendrites that gets integrated onto the cell body or the soma and after this there's some kind of a thresholding mechanism uh, uh the output of which becomes a sort of a one bit representation or a spike or an action potential okay that again gets transmitted via the axon to other other neurons okay and again you can take neurons like these and then you know connect them up in a network to create your big neural network okay. so really if you want to compare with traditional anns what we are uh, talking about is the one that the machine learning community is largely looking at is something like can be represented by a function you have these inputs coming in that are represented by numbers and then these weights are really some weighing factors that are learned and this weighted sum goes through a nonlinear function but if you compare that with what we look at in terms of um, spiking neural networks or even computational neuroscience uh, the one on the left is a very famous set of equations that were developed in the 50s and actually hodgkin and huxley won a nobel prize for that which is you know this set of uh, very complicated nonlinear uh, differential equations uh, there's another equation that i did not write that this current actually gets integrated onto a membrane capacitor but essentially you see that in this case the equations that we have are continuous time differential equations okay so the moment you have these things you make networks out of these it gets a lot more difficult to process or to analyze these kind of systems okay so people have done a lot of simplifications so this is an example of a simplification where you look at the essential dynamical behavior of these hodgkin huxley equations again there are tons of parameters right so depending on the parameter regime you can have different types of behavior so people tend to use dynamical systems theory to reduce these equations into much simpler ones which again are easier to analyze easier to implement on chips and so on but again one of the key things that uh, we think matters is the representation of time okay so that allows you to do a lot of computations potentially very easily okay so this is kind of a background of uh, neuromorphic and spiking neural networks i'll try try to give a couple of quick examples because i know we are really out of time so uh, i'll give two examples for work that we are doing one is a retina inspired camera the other one is uh, related to uh, electronic skin so uh, this neuromorphic vision sensors or cameras are really inspired by how the uh, retinal pathway works and you can actually make a one to one correspondence of the things in the pathway with analog circuits or you can even write down equations for it uh, essentially what turns out happening is uh, these these pathways are sensitive to change in the visual scene and not the absolute intensity of the visual scene so the moment you understand this and you start uh, processing signals in this way you see that the systems can actually support very high dynamic range for example anybody who has played around with a camera would know that you know if you are uh, pointing your camera towards a, a very bright object or if you are next to a very bright object it's very difficult to take your picture right because of this dynamic range issue but these kind of cameras are very good because it's only looking at change with respect to a baseline you get a huge amount of data reduction because you know the background which is kind of static immediately you filter it out you don't really have to process those pixels at all 
because you don't process those pixels, you now can actually react very fast. You only have the moving objects that uh, are kind of getting picked up and you can react to it. And in some sense, it's an ideal sampling scenario, meaning things that are moving slowly will produce less data. Things that are moving fast will produce more data. So uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'll show you an example of a scene. This is showing you when you flip up a pen, you see the neuromorphic camera is totally ignoring the entire background, right? So I can pick up the pen, but because the pen is moving fast, standard cameras start getting motion blur. You can't even see the pen properly, right? But the neuromorphic camera can actually pick up the pen very easily because I'm only sampling those pixels. So I can sample them as fast as I want. Okay. So uh, I'll not go into details of what we have done, but we have essentially looked at you know pipelines where we are comparing these kind of cameras with standard RGB cameras. These cameras that we have are just you know uh, grayscale. So potentially you lose information of color. But what we show is in applications that are very important that people are you know willing to pay money for, like tracking objects in um, in traffic. You can do much better than even state of the art deep learning based systems. Okay, so this is showing an example of cars moving and uh, you know there's a tracker on this and i can show you what's the probability of this object being you know one of these five categories uh, so essentially what we are seeing is you know if you respect some of the constraints initially and then build your system you can end up having a very efficient system instead of always starting from the you know, the deep learning one, which is kind of over parameterized, showing a lot of data, a lot of compute at it, and then trying to you know, downscale from it. Okay, so this is one example. And again, I will be more than happy to discuss about more details of this work and so on. Um, the other example uh, that I would like to give is uh, 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 something that we have been working last maybe just two, three years. And this is really looking at uh, tactile or this feeling of touch. Because if you look at even machine learning community, People talk a lot about vision or audition, you know, because these senses seem to be very dominant. But touch is so important, right? So we are using touch all the time. In fact, in this COVID times, I can feel it more than anything. I am doing this video calls with my father every day, but I just feel like you know, going and touching his hand. I can't do that. Right? So that that sensation is entirely missing. So uh, we believe, you know, there's a lot of scope for doing bio-inspired tactile sensing, something like skin that we have. But if you look at the current tactile sensor arrays that are used in state-of-the-art robotics, what are the challenges in scaling them to human skin-like thing? Human skin, of course, if you think about it, has tons and tons of receptors, right? So if I want to do those receptors, issue becomes wiring. How do I wire to all of those receptors? Then typically people scan out these tactile sensors one by one. If I have a million receptors, the latency in scanning out is huge then I can't do any closed loop task within any reasonable time frame. Third issue comes in terms of robustness or fault tolerance. The moment you start having so many wires, any wire breaks down and potentially you can't even scan out from all of those pixels, right? So it's a huge issue. And the last thing that we kind of started working on was uh, this sensation of pain. Meaning if you look at material science community and Devargo is from that, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, heckle him a little bit on this, but material science community, mostly, you know, when they look at pressure sensors, they just want to make it more and more sensitive. But really they are, uh, if you think about the way we are using touch, a lot of, lot of our learning comes from the sensation of pain, right? That's how we know which signals are good, which signals are bad and so on. So that has largely been ignored. So uh, in our group, in collaboration with material scientists, uh, we developed some artificial skin-like sensors um, that actually allowed us to get robustness and scalability via three mechanisms. Let's talk about some of them. The first one was we made something like a pain receptor or a nociceptor, and it has a lot of properties like sliding thresholds. For example, if if you are if you are hurt on a part of your finger, then the threshold of pain on that part is actually reduced because you know you give it time to heal. Only then you can actually use it in the same way. So that's what we also had in our skin receptor so that the robots endowed with these kind of receptors would actually know which part is damaged and actually give time for that part to heal. When I said heal, yeah, we actually can make them heal because uh, we had some, the material science group had an uh, unique self-healing property in the sensors using some ion gels. 
um i won't talk too much about that but i'll go to the third aspect which was uh, these associative learning so in some sense uh, in biology what we have is the skin receptors uh, actually have nerve bundles nerve fibers that go back to the central nervous system the skin part is considered the peripheral nervous system so this part goes back to the central nervous system which is your brain and spinal cord and then it gets processed right uh, but for us wiring was an issue so what we did we took ideas from the central nervous system and put it into the peripheral nervous system so our robotic nervous system is actually a hybrid so we actually have learning synapses right on the skin why did we do that because now during a learning phase these these red signals are like learning signals corresponding to let's like, say noxious stimuli if the system learns then afterwards when it's working if there is a damage to these receptors these signals are lost even then because the system has learned it it can actually respond appropriately to this noxious stimuli and move the hand away okay so in some sense this is going beyond what biology does and in merging cns and pns functions together okay so uh, i'll quickly talk about uh, the conclusion and some future directions i didn't talk a lot about my brain machine interface work but this has been a uh, ongoing uh, research in my group for the last 10 years so what we are doing now is earlier our work was really um, taking data from the motor cortex decoding it and using it to move an actuator the feedback that the subject would receive was visually because they could see the cursor moving or a hand moving and so on so only visual feedback but really if you want to use something as complex as a artificial hand you do need some kind of sensory feedback coming in so that that was really the motivation for us to look at this tactile sensor array which is now going onto a glove which will be uh, put on the hands of this robotic arm and that would actually give sensory feedback signals to do a second closed loop uh, for us to put it into the bmi system or the brain machine interface system um and the last uh, future uh, work that uh, we are uh, envisioning is because when we did this tactile sensor array this was really made on flexible or printed electronics because you know this has to be going on a glove onto a, a, a kind of a, a distributed area from that we started thinking that okay if we could now think about doing something that could cover even larger areas for example an intelligent wall if i could make a big sensor array on a wall that would be cool right i mean uh, in what sense suppose this wall is now photoreceptive so then instead of having cameras which is very obtrusive uh, you know it's the privacy is totally gone we could have these kind of intelligent walls which could sense humans moving around where could this be useful for example uh, assisted living for the elderly you could really sense where people are if they have fallen down and so on without you know using cameras and uh, like really uh, intruding on your privacy Okay, so so that's kind of uh, where we are going with this in a larger scale uh, looking at assisted living looking at healthcare in hospitals and so on um, and and potentially these two, these two things i think are very new applications for neuromorphic apart from the standard cmos chip design this is looking more at large area circuits and printed electronic kind of uh, design spaces okay so with that i think i would close uh, saying that you know there's potentially a lot of a lot of uh, applications for neuromorphic version 2 and um, i think it's, it's a really bright future ahead of us so a little bit of uh, a little bit of advertisement at the end so uh, we'll be moving our lab in the summer to hong kong from singapore so again new lab so we have a lot of openings for phd's post docs and even the departments looking for a lot of faculty positions so anybody who is interested uh, again please feel free to ping me and we can discuss further on this Thank you. Uh thank you Professor Basu. So I think we have definitely enough I think uh we definitely have exceeded our planned time and uh, as an organizer I take responsibility for that. And uh you know the uh, but but going along the lines of what has been discussed many times during this uh, session that you know, about neural networks which learn and accordingly respond to stimulus in future. So I we I learn from this and accordingly try to design future uh events. but if uh, we can probably you know we can probably take one question for each speaker uh, there is one question for professor basu which we can uh, probably address first and i think it's a very uh, common uh, question regarding uh, neural uh, neuromorphic computing which where he asks so shonak mujumdar is an under, uh, he's a senior year undergraduate student at jadavpur university and he is asking that 
uh, you know, in the in the neuromorphic circuits, which are analog circuits, like you mentioned, uh, how does the precision, um, uh, how, how does that compare? Although it might be quick uh, in, due to its architecture, how does the precision matter? Or would you like to say in similar lines that, you know, does it require to be as sensitive as you were saying uh, for the tactile sensors? So similarly, does that precision, how much really uh, is it and how much is it important for the applications that uh, the neuromorphic circuits are approaching? Okay, uh, uh, great, great question, Shonok. So, I mean, for this one, I could really talk uh, one full day on it, but <laughs> maybe I try to keep it short. Um, I think if you look at uh, the sort of algorithms that we were looking at, uh, mostly like machine learning pattern recognition, it's kind of widely recognized now that you could actually do a lot of the computing with just even four bits, like if you just look at standard digital computing. So, so in terms of uh, precision required, because there's so many parameters, it's like highly over parameterized system, you can easily do away with the precision of each and every uh, parameter in some sense. Yeah. Uh, so there is also a lot of work that shows that, you know, where is the crossover point, right? I said that analog computing is very efficient, but it's only efficient if the precision required is low. So typically you know, the crossover point for analog computing being more efficient than digital is around seven to eight bits. So really for these kind of applications uh, where, you know, we see like three, four bits is good enough. Analog computing seems like definitely the way to go. That, that's number one. Number two uh, thing that I would say is there are in fact uh, several uh, neural networks in our brain uh, which seem to be computing very well with very low precision uh, parameters or synapses. In fact, there are networks that have a large number of connections or weights being totally random. Networks in uh, PFC, prefrontal cortex, are like that. Okay? So only few weights are tuned very well. So, so essentially, I think there's still a lot to be learned. Uh, and potentially, I think, again, as I said, proof is in the pudding because we know the brain works very well. And the brain really does not have very high precision synapses. And anybody who has done experiments would be able to tell you that uh, as well. So um, indeed, I think uh, we could do away with a lot of the precision requirements uh, for these kind of systems. Thanks. So I guess the short answer is that although we don't know how, why it works, uh, which is kind of uh, weird, but we know that it works. And so we would like to emulate it and make things better. And maybe later, uh, make, by, after making things better, we can backtrack and uh, Professor Shita Brustina and others can probably model that and make us understand why it is better. So one that question. There's a famous uh, quote that Carver uh, uh, used to do, and that's like, what you don't understand, what you can't build, you don't understand. So really, you have to try to build it, and then you understand it. Right? <laughs> so one quick question to Professor Sinha uh, is that, you know, uh, let's say if I take a different approach to what one of your mentors think, Professor Bikash uh, Chakraborty, uh, he, he said that, you know, if you don't understand, uh, like, why, why are you trying to understand the human brain if you have not yet understood the worm brain? Uh, so my question is in the other way around, let's say, so as you mentioned, by understanding the different modules in the worm brain and more recently in the primate brain, uh, and you mentioned this sort of uh, this, this phrase, uh, this universal organizing principle that you, you are trying to extract. So how do you think this universal organizing principle that might, you might extract from a C. elegans brain or a primate brain can be used to explain a uh, human brain? Is that directly translational or there is more to learn or can you use the same framework? And uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yeah, thanks, Devarko. Yeah, it's of course a wonderful question. Um, you know, you're absolutely right uh, because uh, C. elegans and uh, human brain are essentially, you know, so very different in terms of the orders of magnitude involved. You could well say that, you know, Maybe nature has figured out different ways in, to make these uh, principles work. So that's why you know you actually have to test it, right? So so we were as surprised as anyone when we found that essentially the same uh, intra intermodular connectivity principle that we saw in Seligans also operates in the primate brain, and even more surprised when we found that it actually has a functional role. I mean, namely, basically you know, uh, making information transfer extremely rapid. So I guess the short answer to your question is that, you know, 
we, we don't know for sure if there is indeed a single principle which unites um, a network of 300 neurons and a network of, you know, a 10 to the power 12 neurons. But every little fact that we uncover, for example, this particular principle that the same mesoscopic organizational feature is operating across the scales, each little feature we uncover basically, you know, is one more step towards building some kind of a comprehensive theory for understanding nervous system and kind of, you know, harks back to the point I mentioned earlier. So, you know, this, this whole point, can you abstract out principles of information processing that holds irrespective of what is the material which is embodying it? You know, it's of course a philosophical question and Daniel Dennett has, uh, you know, written whole books on this, uh, but, it's it's interesting that computational neuroscience can now actually try to say something about it. You know, essentially, it can say that look, if you build, you know, networks of switches, let's say glorified switches, which you know work on this principle, it would, in some sense, be extremely efficient in terms of information communication. Whether it applies to you know everything else, jury is still out. Got it. Sure. So we'll we'll check it and we'll see how much of that can be translated, or maybe we'll have to build something new. But definitely, some of the framework will help us make the relations. So thanks, uh, Professor Sina. Once again, I have one last question for for uh, Professor Ganguly. So you'd mentioned about dopamine cytotoxicity, and to my knowledge, as you know, someone who is just looking into a little bit of biology in in terms of research, I mean, adding a little bit of biology in my research, but not really. I don't have a biology background as such. So please correct me if I'm wrong. But dopamine seems to be a very popular uh, a popular uh, hormone, uh, and in the sense that uh, you know, when apparently when we are scrolling down through Facebook posts. It, they give us shots of uh, our brain or our, our system gives us a shot of dopamine, which helps us, you know, it, it, uh, it creates like it, this hormone has this craving, uh, you know, inst uh, stimulation and other sort of uh, feeling rewarding stimulation and so on. So when you say this dopamine cytotoxicity in the uh, nervous system, uh, in a layman's question, how much of Facebook should I is okay for me to stay below the cytotoxic level of dopamine, or you know, uh, how much, how how what's the uh, what's the uh, how much of a Facebook, uh, you know, can can Facebook too much doing too much Facebook or other social media trigger these cytotoxic effects in our in our brain? Uh, I think you're muted. Yeah, now can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yeah. See, whenever we uh, study anything, you know, uh, in the brain, I mean, uh, throughout the body, we have this one very important term known as homeostasis. So, and every molecule can have two types of effects, like uh, the antioxidants, which are so easily used in the market like uh, vitamin C or vitamin E or several other vitamins we are taking as antioxidants. They can also act as pro-oxidants when they are in a high concentration. So at that time they become, they have more damaging role than protect. So they are said to be as a double-edged sword. So similarly dopamine, uh, you know, dopaminergic neurons are very essential for functioning Dopamine has several important functions as a neurotransmitter and all that. But when at local levels, the concentration increases due to some pathology and that can itself cause toxicity. Like uh, I'll give a very simple example. Like we have hydrochloric acid in our stomach and the pH of that hydrochloric acid is stronger than the HCl you use to clean your bathrooms. That is it is less than even 1.5. And you can imagine if, if we ever poured the HCl of the of, of, uh, I mean bathroom uh, as few drops on the floor, you can see fumes coming out. It is so concentrated. So we have an HCl which is much more concentrated than that within our uh, simple naive stomach, yet it is performing brilliantly because it has mechanisms 
to protect it has mechanisms or controlled homeostasis of that secretion and neutralization but when that is disturbed due to some chemicals due to some disease due to some uh, addiction anything that layers get disturbed and they cause violent peptic ulcers and ruptures emergency people coming with perforated abdomens so similarly what we are trying to uh, when we are doing neuro regeneration we were actually trying to i mean we are actually trying to see how the normally present or the vitally important endogenous substances uh, can be toxic to those neurons locally sorry i think you got muted once again so similarly i think and that too yeah now i'm audible yeah hello yeah so i think uh, facebook uh, you know they are not that much proved by experiments and all but uh, there is nothing absolute you, know, you cannot just say that this much will cause this much of damage and again that is individualized we have something called as uh, receptor uh, heterogeneity i mean the same molecule same substance same concentration cannot be homogeneously predicted to have the same amount of effects in all individuals uh, you, you can see even if you even see those who are having alcohol they have a wide range of variation of effects on the same molecule <laughs> and the same concentration they are having similarly with some uh, neuro stimulators as well so this is it so this is why it is very difficult you know to indi so every uh, disease pathology and its mechanisms are to some extent individualized to the person to, a, to what extent the symptoms will come i think uh, <laughs> that yeah. sure thank you got it so i mean i yeah. guess uh, we don't know exactly how much but too much is is toxic <laughs> let's say right say. <laughs> right uh, so okay so we can probably wrap up do you have uh, professor ganguly professor basu professor sinha do you have any last uh, comments thoughts before we call it a day I mean, I think uh, I'll just again uh, go ahead and thank you, uh, Devargo, and all the others here for organizing this. I think it was brilliant, um, and I mean, I actually was fascinated by a lot of the stuff that was dis- discuss- discussed today. So hopefully, you know, we'll forge forge more connections with other JB scholars, and uh, hopefully, I'll I'll probably try to attend more talks. now that i know what's what's going on so uh, thanks once again for doing this and again if anybody has anything else that you want to discuss uh, just feel free to email me so uh, i'd be happy to discuss more thank you yeah i'll i'll actually uh, reach out to you regarding the touch communication we have been think some of us have been thinking along those lines uh, so professor sinha do you have something to add yeah i'd like to second arindam uh, i think it's fantastic you know what uh, you you are doing i mean you and your team of course i i, I do know that it's it's not a single effort but uh, you know it's really appreciated you know although you know all of us don't get the time to you know listen to the talks live as i mentioned i do you know like uh, look at some of these videos uh, occasionally and all of them are actually extremely exciting you know it's it's really lovely to know that the jb community is so active and um, thanks to you you know like for you know essentially getting us connected sure sure no thank you thank you everyone for you know responding so well and have forming the database has actually i mean it helped me see whom to reach out to and probably put together this uh, uh this panel however uh, well or not well not so well it has uh, panned out but uh, we will plan uh, try to plan similar uh, you know interdisciplinary or things like that uh, panels in future so definitely would like to see you there as well Thank you.